So you can see my screen now, and I will uh, just give a very short welcome to the webinar. Uh, my name is Jens. I will be presenting myself a little bit later. Uh, but our seminar is entitled, How Can Digital Tools and New Teaching Methods Improve Students' Learning? We have presentation from a number of different projects. So the agenda is we have 10 minutes per talk, maybe one or two questions after each talk. Uh, then there is a short panel discussion at the end. We will finish by 11.30. And then there is a list of the presentations here. And I will not go through everything in detail. I will just ask uh, Michael, Mikhail, to, uh, to start giving the first presentation. Yep. So in the following 10 minutes, I would like to share with you um, my experience from teaching augmented reality to computer science students under lockdown. Um, this is a work we have done in the Erasmus Plus project AR for you. We have a different brand name for it, Code Reality. And my name is Mikael van Nick. I represent Molde University College in Norway and also a few other universities and other organizations. Um, I would like to go through three major points at this presentation. First, I would like to introduce what Code Reality is. This is a consortium of five universities funded by Erasmus Plus, and we are working on a new education offer on the topic of augmented reality or AR. Um, then I will introduce um, our courses that we have developed. We developed a foundations of AR face-to-face -face course, which we run in spring 2019. Then um, we transformed it slowly into um, an online course in uh, early spring this year. We then have developed an advanced augmented reality course um, later this spring, which was canceled, a face-to-face -face pilot because of the um, pandemic. And then we had to rapidly transform it into an online course. And in the third part, I will um, talk about the pandemic-induced constraints on such a rapid transformation to digital, uh, to, to online course. And um, uh, I, will, um, I will not be able to cover everything, but I will share with you some of the um, key differences we found in teaching before the pandemic and during the pandemic and how they affected so, um, the transformation from a face-to-face -to, -face to online and also um, about our decisions and some recommendations specifically in teaching such a hardcore computer science topic under the lockdown. So about the code reality, uh, we started a project uh, working on a state of the art. We did a explicit and a very thorough search of uh, existing teaching practices. And we only found um, at that time, uh, 15 universities in the world who are teaching augmented reality courses. So the educational offer is very limited. The topic is very new and, and very rapidly developing. We also looked at uh, the um, labor market needs. We did a uh, job market analysis and we looked at what kind of skills the industry are looking at and, um, and how the educational offers cover those skills. This can be found in the report that you can see now on the left of your screen. We also work on developing a model curriculum for AR since uh, all the educational offers we found are really um, different. There is no reference model. Uh, there are different topics that are covered in different AR courses and um, thus a model uh, is needed. Then we have also developed two courses and both of them are in face-to-face um, -face and an online format. We also work on developing various educational materials on the, the topic of AR. I can now introduce the courses so you understand a little bit what uh, we're teaching exactly. So the foundations course uh, consists of some theory uh, that you can see on the left and practice you can see on the right it's a very an introductory course and um, we cover the overview of the technology uh, with the introduction history technology overview research directions and some basics in software development 
then we go specifically into augmented reality development, again, on a very, very basic level. Uh, we cover uh, human computer interaction or HCI quite in detail with methodologies, perceptual augmentation, UX design, spatial computing, and some uh, tutorials on um, uh, mapping, gaze and gesture that you can work on uh, with the HoloLens glasses. We also cover the very, very basics of computer vision and computer graphics. So this course actually fits uh, both computer science students on a uh, beginner bachelor level probably, but also any um, students from other study programs such as um, art, media, communication, design. So that is um, also designed for the target group. And then now in the advanced course, we have, uh, um, again, um, um, both theory and practice, and we go um, much more specifically and then much deeper into HCI, um, and, then, and then also covering uh, much lower level computer vision and graphics, and uh, go into more um, technical subjects such as also data science, artificial intelligence, and um, AR development and hardware. So um, in terms of the challenges of the uh, transformation from the face-to-face uh, -face into online, we took our time last year, we did a face-to-face -face pilot of our foundations course in spring last year, and we took almost 10 months to slowly transform it into an online course, which we released early spring this year. And then our face-to-face -face, um, pilot of the advanced course was scheduled for third week of April this year. But then in the uh, second week of March, we had to cancel it. And that left us only five weeks to rapidly transform the course into the online format. So we decided, so we keep it on schedule and um, we only had five weeks. So what did we do in these five weeks? Um, is also um, going to be published soon in a paper in the Actel conference. So we could not really um, aim to describe or to, to do anything, you know, uh, ideal um, online learning uh, experience uh, for, for such a course in such a short time. But uh, we've got a lot of experience now how to transform a course from uh, what we've originally prepared in a face-to-face -face format in the online format uh, in a very short time and with uh, almost no resources available. And uh, this is um, a really uh, a large table with a lot of stuff on it. I can go through uh, some of the uh, highlighted things here. So on the left hand side, you see the major key points that we found are different before the pandemic and during the pandemic. Everything is, will be fully published on the, in the paper so you can read about it. But I can name those highlighted in red on the left. So the access to space and equipment is very different. Uh, the infrastructure is different. Um, the work-life balance is uh, very much affected. Social distances is in place. Um, then evaluation is uh, very different. All the students' assignments, for example, circadian rhythms affect uh, how we work. Mental health and also physical health, social awareness, attrition, and then openness and the student support. As you can see on the right, some of the um, some of the small points are highlighted in green. They are actually positive under the lockdown. So it allows you to be a bit more open. But some of them clearly are um, negative. And uh, on some of them, you as a teacher or instructional designer or as a researcher can uh, act. And on some of them, you cannot really act and you cannot do anything you have to adapt. And this is um, the last slide so I can share some of the decisions we took. And I hope I can take half a minute more of the time on the presentation. So half a minute is okay. The six major, thank you, the six major decisions we took were to expand the target audience to literally anyone. And we, just, we opened the course into a MOOC format and uh, to anyone to register. We also relaxed the timeline. So we, we um, since we didn't need to travel um, to the course, 
which was going to be a condensed week of uh, of um, intense uh, training. So we uh, relaxed the tournament into um, ten weeks, eleven weeks. Then um, we uh, chose a digital platform, Moodle, on our own server, so we can um, return IP, uh, use our branding. Um, we can configure it as as we like, but of course there are also some uh, um, negative uh, things that we actually had to do all that and we um, also depended on uh, the server we used. Uh, in terms of the lectures we pre-recorded everything and for each lecture we made uh, several short videos and mostly we did them as, as demonstrations uh, of slides and um, something on the screen and then uh, picture in picture with a narrator. For practices, which is uh, the most interesting thing because the, the course actually required to work a lot hands-on on, on uh, equipment, uh, smart glasses, AR glasses, uh, sensors, and uh, stuff like that. So we had to actually um, um, do some um, contingency here. So we did, we did video tutorials, which was possible to demonstrate on the screen, sharing um, um, the application and what uh, the instructor is doing there. We also made some of the tutorials both as video and text. Some of them are only as text-based tutorials with web pages, embedded screenshots, videos, and links. And also we shared some of the um, materials of um, applications of different stages in different stages of development so that the students can follow step by step or starting from uh, step number two or three. And finally, we also um, um, created our own AR teaching book. With, which is um, continuously developed and also we opened it up uh, for anyone to contribute to different chapters and also we published both lectures and tutorials. So this is the presentation, sorry for taking a bit longer. Um, there are links to the project that I've talked about, uh, my page. I am also very much engaged into doctoral education in technology enhanced learning. Thus there is a link below here in the middle and also we have um, another Erasmus project on doctoral education detail. I also run a lab in another university in Norway in the immersive technology and also work on another Erasmus on, um, language teaching and using technology for that. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mikhail. Tim from uh, Tim Meitschak. Then I will uh, leave the word completely to you. Good morning also from my side and uh, thank you for inviting me or inviting us as a project uh, to this webinar. I will today uh, give you a quick talk about uh, virtual reality in higher education uh, where we have worked on recommendations and application scenarios. Very briefly, um, introduction, uh, introduction of myself. Uh, my name is Tim, Tim Maischak, and uh, I'm also uh, working in Norway. I'm a professor in information systems there. And the work I'm talking about is uh, embedded in a project with uh, three main partners. Uh, the consortium leaders coming from the University of Liechtenstein. Then we have the uh, University of Duisburg Essen, Germany on board. And finally, uh, my university, University of ACTA, uh, based in Christiansand, uh, Norway. And we have one associated partner, which is the European Research Center in Information Systems uh, from Münster in Germany. In our project, we have uh, set the goal to say there's a lot of virtual reality technology out there. There's a lot of things being tried out, but most of this has a pretty much experimental character. Everyone is doing a bit here, a bit there, but it's neither systematical nor are there good materials that would uh, tell newcomers, people who want to enter the field, people who say we want to transform, for example, our uh, courses uh, to a more virtual format, what to do. And therefore, our goal is to create guidelines or guiding materials in a more broader sense on the use of virtual reality in higher education. And for that purpose, we have three sub goals. First, to collect and systematize application scenarios, so to find out where does virtual reality fit. Then to evaluate and derive recommendations, that is now the actual guiding part. And then to prove that what we're doing uh, might have some impact and might actually be helpful to come up with prototypical implementations of virtual reality in higher education courses. Prototypical implementations sounds uh, now um, 
greater than it really is. This uh, doesn't mean that we will uh, transform uh, your whole university landscape, but it rather means that for selected courses, we will try to show that virtual reality can actually have a beneficial impact or can contribute beneficially to that course. Progress in the project uh, so far can be uh, summarized as follows. We have been mainly working on four topics. First of all, we've done a survey with 128 participants from European countries in which we try to find out a bit on the status quo of virtual reality usage in higher education. And fortunately for the project, uh, the result was a quite overwhelming interest in uh, virtual reality. We have conducted a very comprehensive literature analysis um, published uh, only a few months back and already quite highly cited. So that uh, hit what I would say um, a gap to have a systematic study of what is out there, what can be reported. And um, main contribution of this would be classification of the field of applications, domains of learning content of design elements used in virtual reality in higher education courses. Um, what I would say is one more finding of this literature study is that from the published work, there is a lot of experimental stuff, there's a lot of case studies, there's a lot of sim single applications, but there's hardly anything that would go into this direction that we are now envisioning to bring it all together, to look at it holistically, to say um, there's a whole vision behind that. And this would indicate that this whole research field is rather young and there's a lot of things still happening and a lot of uh, work still to be done. We are currently finishing our market analysis. This is uh, kind of um, the counterpart to the literature study, literature study theory driven from academia, market analysis practically driven from uh, say the real world. And uh, there we found there's a few common application areas, uh, probably not the most uh, ones to be expected, biology, zoology, astronomy, as those where you find quite a lot already. And uh, most of the current virtual reality applications in higher education look at uh, conveying procedural practice and declarative knowledge. So these, these are the characteristics of virtual reality applications to be found so far. And we are currently working on developing application scenarios. We're doing this based on design thinking workshops that we had with uh, educators in uh, different places. And the outcome of that should be actual usable application scenarios, which then can be used to generate the more general guidelines that should give um, educators a possibility to say, okay, this could work and this could not work for me. Few um, examples for recommendations so far, and I guess you'll agree this hardly is rocket science. Nevertheless, it is about trying to theoreticize about what we already know and what we don't know. First recommendation would be for designers of courses and also teachers to incorporate feedback to ensure that students can evaluate the learning process. That is something that we've heard quite a few times. And while it might sound obvious that you need to incorporate feedback when you're working with um, virtual, um, virtual technology, it is not obvious to be doing that. Like with our first um, presentation when Michael asked everyone, just switch on your camera. That was a kind of feedback. That was a way of uh, breaking the ice for the presentation. And doing this kind of stuff is particularly important uh, to get people on board if you're doing virtual stuff. Um, teachers should not provide whole courses in virtual reality. So it is a kind of fallacy that many uh, educators who first uh, touch upon virtual reality think, now everything needs to be virtualized. I need to fully transform my course into virtual space. But unless you have very good reason to be doing so, this is poised to fail. Teachers uh, should have, um, should provide learning content for different difficulty levels. So. Um, this is to say it is very hard to find a one-size-fits-all solution for virtual reality in teaching. Um, 
We also find that students want to have a closed room to avoid embarrassment. Um, I guess you've all heard uh, reports about Zoom bombing and this kind of stuff. And while for us as educators, this might be a nuisance and we say this is very annoying, we need to stop it. For students, it can be a moment that in a way kills their virtual reality experience. And therefore, teachers or educators more in general have to assure the safety and make need to make sure that uh, for students the learning environment the virtual learning environment will be pleasant uh, pleasant one um, lecturers should use virtual reality applications that make teaching more practice oriented again sounds a bit uh, like a no-brainer um, practically making it more practice oriented is something that can require a tremendous amount of work on the educator side. Um, we have also found that uh, resonates with literature that the learning by doing aspect that can be facilitated by virtual reality technologies in education is probably one of the strongest arguments for embracing it. And finally, researchers should conduct uh, investigations before deciding on a target learning outcomes. So to say, it is not clear if you take an existing course and say we have all learning outcomes, now let's make this stuff virtual, that that will work. But it requires quite profound investigation beforehand to say what can be the targeted learning outcomes for the course. That's it in all uh, brevity. I would like to thank you for your attention and with any questions, comments, or simply the wish to be kept in the loop since we are uh, ongoingly working with this project and there will be uh, much more to come, more detailed recommendations also, I would uh, kindly ask you to reach out to me and I will share the output, the input uh, with the team, get you in touch with the respective uh, people working on the topic and be very, happy to um, probably even collaborate or at least to um, keep on discussing. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. So uh, I think we can move on to the next presentation, which is by, I hope I pronounce it correctly, Deborah. Okay, so thank you very much. And um, to start with, just a huge thanks to, to Jens for um, uh, bringing us all together. Uh, this is great because uh, I don't know many of these projects, so it's I think it's a good opportunity for us to develop more synergies. Um, so I'm here to talk about uh, Ellen for Life, which is a, an Erasmus Plus strategic partnership project, uh, all about learning and interacting to foster employability. We're looking at active learning for soft skills development, um, and uh, I already heard in uh, we already heard in uh, the presentation just given by Tim about this learning by doing. So I think there's lots of scope for us to work together um, on uh, on active learning. Um, why am I not moving forward? Here we go. Um, so Ellen for Life brings together how many have we got? Seven partners. Um, from Italy, from Poland, from Belgium, from Scotland, uh, and from Germany. Uh, I work at uh, UNEJ, which is the French Digital University for Management and Economics, a national and international projects coordinator. And um, uh, Ellen is, uh, has an interesting history. We got together back in 2003 um or it <laughs> seems like uh, uh millennials millennia ago um we were part of uh, case studies for done by the Un uh, the european commission on e-learning uh, in european higher education and uh from that uh period we got together and we developed our first european project on teacher training back in 2004 2005 and we've been working together ever since with a, um, a shifting partnership but around the core partners um, of uh, Politecnico di Milano, Onej and uh, Bremen um, and this is our sixth European project together. So LN for Life focuses on um, overcoming the skills mis mismatches in particular with respect to transversal skills, soft skills, um, we're looking at uh, supporting uh, higher education institutions and teachers in particular uh, in embedding uh, soft skills development and active learning uh, in the curriculum. 
and uh, we're also looking at the cross-fertilization of approaches between higher education and the corporate sector. So um, our work is organized around seven outputs, uh, the first two which uh, have been completed. We started in September 2018, so we're coming up to two thirds of the way through the, the three year project. Uh, so the first outputs were uh, report based, a transnational analysis in higher education and one in the corporate sector, always focusing on um, uh, active learning methods for soft skills development. And we pulled these together in a first publication of the Lessons Learned Kit, uh, which you can find on the website. I'll share the, the link at the end of this short talk. Um, we're now concentrating on this group of outputs, uh, which is uh, the development of a dynamic toolkit, which is, uh, I'll show you in a moment, uh, which is a collection of um, methods for active learning in the field of soft skills development. And these methods that we've collected and presented, which are open for anybody to use, are currently being tested in pilot projects and are going to serve as input for a discussion-based MOOC for teachers, which should be launched uh, in January. And to um, encourage the conversation around this, we've developed a community of practice, uh, which is distributed across social media. It also involves national working groups, which in the current situation, um, we will probably be running as, as webinars, um, although we would like to still get people together face-to-face -face at some point. So just a quick focus on the dynamic toolkit. Um, as I said, we've got 30 selected active learning methods. These came from the scoping exercises that we did in um, higher education and in the corporate sector. Uh, they can be filtered by uh, skills, digital skills, methodological, personal and social, uh, which build our, which are referenced according to the soft skills framework which we developed in the previous project, which is called LN for Work. They can be selected according to, filtered according to modality. Um, and it's particularly important, as we've realized uh, over the past few months, to look at active learning online. Um, and we're going to be uh, publishing a blog post specific to um, active learning online uh, very, very shortly. Also, because we've got several different types of um, activity, um, the timing is important, being able to filter according to whether it's um, a week or a month long activity, whether it's a short activity that you can just embed in an existing class. Uh, and we're also very interested in focusing on the group size. Um, if uh, certain active learning methods can be done in very, very large groups, um, which is not always the case, that was one of our findings, uh, that very, very few uh, examples we found of, uh, of large groups. Uh, but you can have a look at the dynamic toolkit, play around with it, um, test the scenarios that we have, and also contribute new scenarios as well. Do get in touch if you would like um, a particular, I'm thinking of uh, uh, what Tim mentioned uh, in relation to virtual reality, that might be uh, very interested to have uh, a scenario on that. Um, so a, few, a bit of information about the pilot projects. These are running currently running in five countries. Um, the teachers select a method from the toolkit, which I just presented you. They describe their intention. They keep a logbook, so it's a reflective ongoing process. We're collecting student feedback via a survey, uh, doing interviews with teachers, um, not only to collect feedback, but also to provide uh, video content for the discussion-based MOOC. So it's all articulated um, around the, the, the family of, uh, of outputs. Um, and what we obviously had, were confronted with as well uh, was that um, uh, many of the, the pilots that we had lined up were supposed to be done during face-to-face -face classes and uh, with the emergency switch to online teaching. Um, we lost a few, we replaced a few, um, and some teachers very, very quickly switched their uh, modality uh, to do the pilots online. So I think we're going to get quite a lot of interesting insights from those pilots. Uh, you can find all the resources on our website. Everything is shared in an open uh, Google folder as well. Uh, you can get the reports, um, the lessons learned kit, and a lot more from the 
website. And finally, you can join the community of practice, get us on Twitter, in LinkedIn. Um, you could write a guest blog post for our LN for Life website, if you like. So lots of opportunities uh, for future collaboration. Thank you very much. Ah, I see a question. Um, in short and plain words, how can digital tools improve employability? Um, my answer would be, it's not the tools, it's the way you use them. Um, it's the collaboration, it's the identification of the soft skills uh, that are being mobilized. Uh, for example, in the methodological skills, we have things like learning to learn, um, self-assessment. Um, uh, in the social skills, we've got things like collaboration, teamwork, negotiation, leadership. Um, in the intrapersonal skills, we've got things like self-leadership, uh, critical thinking, and so on. So these are all the skills that, um, uh, that employers are looking for. Um, so that's the link with employability. And the other link is also in building this community of practice uh, and the cross fertilization. So just very, very quickly, one of the things that we found uh, was that um, uh, the active learning techniques that are being used in the corporate sector um, are perhaps more advanced than in higher education. The actual digital tools that are being used, a lot of the soft skills training um, in uh, the corporate sector is embedded in daily working practices. So they're using Microsoft Teams and so on. And I think what we've seen with the pandemic uh, is that universities are beginning to use these, uh, these tools, uh, but not necessarily in the most active learning ways. Um, I'm thinking of the three hour Zoom lecture. Um, so there's still lots of work to be done um, in, uh, in, in taking this up and building on it. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for, uh, for the presentation. I think we will move on to the next presentation, which is by Stephanie Kroner. Yes, uh, thank you so much. Today, I would like to give you a short presentation on the digital tools we use within this Erasmus Plus strategic partnership, which is in the field of adult education and lifelong learning. We have a partnership of 10 partners this is our second um, Erasmus Plus strategic partnership already. And our partners are eight university partners from Portugal, Slovenia, Italy, Ireland, Hungary, and Germany. And we have two practice partners, which are DVB International and the European Association for the Education of Adults. Because our target in Intel is uh, no, um, to develop a joint blended learning uh, module for students and practitioners together. One second, yeah. And um, therefore we work together with those um, two partners from practice and theory um, to um, create this joint learning module that on the one side can be studied within master and PhD programs where students can earn up to 12 ECTS points. And at the same time, the module can be studied by persons already working for even many years in adult education practice, and they can observe this module within scientific um, training or further training in their professional path. And we start with a blended learning preparation, which takes three months and um, is a challenge that we absolve or do with digital media. And in this three month blended learning preparation, we prepare the participants, the students and practitioners for the two week model, which will take place in, in Würzburg. We call it a winter school because it's in Feb it takes place in in February and the students from our university partners and um, colleagues from the um, who are affiliated with the practice partners join us for the two-week winter school and sometimes it's even up to 100 participants um, who join us but sometimes we are also less like 50 or 60 participants from all partners and as um, our module also 
gears at um, improving employability of students, especially um, we use social media to connect the students with the practice organizations. So they can um, stay in touch over professional networks such as uh, LinkedIn um, to, um, for instance, um, apply for internships or search for experts in a field if they search for uh, further training. The um, preparation of the two week winter school, we have three didactical targets. One is that we want to introduce the students to the self regulated learning. And we do this with an online tutorial that is available online on our website. And you can also see it and um, it's open access at go.univu.de slash intel. Furthermore, we have a weekly assignments for the students which we do with a blended a learning platform that is Moodle-based. And last but not least, um, we want uh, to support the students and participants in their individual research on transnational essays. So we also have online a literature database that I will introduce to you in a second. The self-regulated learning is um, often is new to our students because, I mean, of course, they know the blended learning method, which is next to seminars, but most of them did not prepare like three months for an, a joint module and for their presence teaching. So we guide them step by step and have seven online tutorials with videos, online texts and guides and introduce them to the main topics of our module. And this is, for instance, um, policies in adult education. We also give them examples on comparative studies, which would be, for instance, career guidance in Italy and in Portugal, and how a comparative study can be conducted. And also, we give them concrete guidelines. We have elaborated several guides so that the participants learn scientific working and scientific research in this context of comparative research in the field of adult education. And this is, for instance, that we guide them how to write a transnational essay. In the weekly assignments, um, the online tutorial is embedded on the blended learning platform. So the students can use videos, online texts and guides and they receive from us a weekly reminder to do their assignment. They can see this in the forum, but also will receive a notifica notification via email. And we use the forum so that students can introduce themselves, they can reflect with other participants they have never met in person upon the assignments, which could be, for example, um, discussing about questions um, we gave them on the reading tasks and also to discuss their own transnational essay, whereas um, this essay is part of the preparation where they start to do their own research. And as I announced, we give them a literature database on our website where they can do individual research. And in a presence in class teaching, we would give this information um, orally to the students and would tell them, for your research, please consider that source and that source. If you search for, re for information from that country, this report and this policy paper might be relevant for you. And now we wrote all those information down in a very short, descriptive manner and have an overview of many rep reports and policy papers on our websites. So this um, short description will guide the students to do their own research. And of course, they can discuss this on the blended learning website. Within the two week winter school, we also use a digital media. And the one target is we want to create an optimal follow up for participants that they receive or that they have access to all materials and all results of the group work and they did in the two week presence phase. So we upload everything at the blended learning platform. 
Another digital media offer um, we have is an e-learning module for students without physical mobility, for students who cannot join the presence phase. So we make videos and photos during the two-week um, winter school program and provide this online. And also from the um, from specific groups or from specific top topics, we create online assignments, literature databases, and quizzes so that the module also can be studied in an e-learning mode without any um, meeting um, in reality. And we also use um, digital media, media such as videos and photos within the presence phase to um, prepare the future participants so that they can imagine um, have an imagination what will happen in the program. Last but not least, we use social media um, for the professional networking of our participants. So we have created a LinkedIn professional network for adult education and lifelong learning. We have um, already now over 1,000 members and a community, a great online community where we share all, all the, so the participants and members share job postings. They can contact to reach international experts and they can post professionalization and learning possibilities. Furthermore, we use um, social media to make our activities more visible, such as journal, journals, call for papers, conferences, and webinars. And um, we also not only use LinkedIn, but also Twitter, and we connect both channels with the hashtags, which are AB Würzburg and hashtag AE Academy Würzburg. So um, thank you very much for your attention. I think my time is over. Um, yeah, if you want, please check our website because I think we also have uh, a lot of material as on teaching methods, didactics, and that are relevant for other fields in higher education. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. Good. Then the next on the agenda is myself. So my presentation is on uh, the strategic partnership, which we call EPIC, which is about Im improving employability through internationalization and collaboration. Uh, so what I will talk about now is really blended mobilities for international student project. Uh, so what EPIC is all about is really bringing students together uh, from different places, from different disciplines, from different universities to work on joint products and on joint problems. And it's something that we also did in previous uh, strategic partnerships, but this time we, uh, we put on some new constraints that I will tell about in a, in a moment. But what you see here is really a group of students from Denmark, from Turkey, from the Netherlands, from, from Spain, from Catalonia, uh, who are working on a joint project. And this is from a previous meeting in Barcelona, when it was still possible to actually do meetings. Uh, so we have project partners from, I would say, all over, all over Europe, from the north, from the east, from the south, from the west, from Turkey as well. Um, and this is the semester as we plan it. So uh, what it's really about is to solve real world problems. And in this semester, we had a particular focus on the sustainable development goals. So what is keeping all the different student projects together is that they are all working on solving some of the UN uh, sustainable development goals. Uh, it's about working across universities, disciplines, and the countries. Um, and it's all done according to local university rules. So uh, for some students, it might be their bachelor project. For some students, it might be another kind of project during the semester. For some, it might be the master thesis projects. Uh, the whole principle is that it's not a joint course per se, because all the students are evaluated, are evaluated according to the home rules. And we have done this because we want to create something that is scalable and something that can also work even after we don't have the strategic partnership anymore. And when we have done it before, it has been, you can say, pretty much handheld solutions in order to credit the students for it. But this is scalable. And in this way, we can take in new partners, we can work together with other 
um, universities without having to change a lot of things. So the semester is organized like this. The students apply for participation uh, in the end of November and we assign them the projects by the 1st of December. So when the students apply, they indicate which project they would like to work on. Then we form the groups to ensure that all the groups of students from different disciplines and from different universities. Uh, there is a preparation phase where the students are following online modules that we have created, which are dealing with entrepreneurship, sustainability, uh, group work, teamwork, project planning. And then the students start working on the projects uh, after those modules. And in fact, and that's what I also try to indicate here, actually there is some flexibility in when the product work is starting and finishing because on all the different universities, we have different schedules. So some students might start a little bit earlier than others, but the main kickoff we really have in February. So in February, we have a, a seminar where all the students, all the supervisors are meeting face to face for five days. Uh, this year it was in Hamburg in Germany. It was uh, just one month before the, the whole COVID-19 situation started. So, um, so we would have it as a completely normal meeting. And then after the seminar, the students start with the virtual collaboration and then they collaborate virtually for the rest of the semester. We actually had here also the possibility for an additional physical meeting, not bringing everyone together at the same time, but bringing together uh, the students who are working in groups together. Uh, unfortunately, due to, the, due to the corona situation, we couldn't do it this year, so all the collaboration here was, uh, was a physical collaboration. I should also say that when we are talking about the groups, the groups here are usually between four students and nine students, so that's the group size. And then uh, they are working together, solving the problems together, they are making a joint product hand-in, and they are also making a local product hand-in and a local product defense, which is actually where they get the grade and where they get the recognition. So the, the joint aspect is on top of what we, uh, on, the, on top of the local rules and regulations. Um, I would also say that actually uh, for this year, which is the last year of the partnership, we also had students from Brazil participating. So they didn't get funding for the project, they didn't get funding from Erasmus, but they, they participated in the seminar and they also participated in the project. And I think it's actually some of the best projects we were doing with them. So uh, as an example, for the projects we were doing, we were having a, a total of nine groups. And of the nine groups, three of them were working with the projects from Brazil. Uh, and we were working with a concrete case it's always nice to work with some concrete problems. And the concrete uh, case was uh, waste pickers in Brazil. So in Brasilia, the capital of Brazil, um, one and a half year ago, approximately one and a half year ago, they closed the world largest dump site. And in this dump site, thousands of people were working, um, waiting for the trucks to arrive with the garbage or waste. And then they were going through the waste, finding things they could eat or things they could sell. And, uh, and they were living uh, from, from this. So they were basic, basically living off these, uh, this big, um, um, yeah, this big, uh, what's called? Uh, waste, yeah, waste. So, um, so um, we are helping them in the projects to create a better life. There have been some projects already in the city of Brasilia, helping the, the people who were working on the dump site to get into working in real recycling centers. And that is what you see here, is actually the work in the recycling centers. Uh, and we were doing three projects working, helping those waste pickers. One was with respect to learning, making a mobile app, which was specifically for those waste pickers. And you can ask, do they actually have smartphones? The answer is yes, they do have smartphones. Uh, many of them are illiterate uh, and um, and many of them have a challenge just getting an everyday life to work when they don't get money every day, but they get money every two weeks. Um, but with mobile apps, we can actually do a lot because we can make education even for illiterate people because we have, you have videos, you have talk, you can, you can do a lot. So we had some students working on the mobile app 
we had some students working on improving the waste collection, which is a much more technical project about having sensors in the in the waste bins so they can collect the garbage at the right time uh, and before uh, valuable garbage is stolen by someone else. And that's actually a big problem that the most valuable waste for recycling is being stolen before it's reaching the recycling centers. So in this way, they can optimize their earnings by optimizing the waste collection. And then another group were working with river waste plastic recovery. And from here, we had students from production engineering, from IT, from electrical engineering, from, um, from psychology, from textile uh, management, textile design. Uh, so a wide range of students who are working together uh, saying, how can we help those waste pickers? Because how can we help those poor people to achieve a better life? And, and these are three sub-projects from it. When we look at the evaluation from the students, uh, these are the evaluations from last year, asking the students, how do, did they feel about working on real life problems across uh, cultures in this uh, blended fashion? They were in general really happy with the results. So we see that um, now these are, asked, these are actually some of the objectives from the Erasmus Plus, so I will not read all of it. I don't have time for it. But uh, the one scoring the highest with 90% of the students finding that to a high, a very high degree, it helped them with problem skills, uh, problem solving skills, collaboration skills, entrepreneurial skills, and skills within creativity and innovation. And then other learning points is that the students really appreciated working on real life problems, working with sustainability, working across disciplines and internationally, and especially the seminar or the seminars is something that they have been really happy about. I also think that the physical seminar, the face-to-face -face meeting, is really crucial to initiate the online collaboration. Uh, maybe uh, things are changing now and maybe people are getting more used to online collaboration, but having a good product plan when they're leaving the seminar is really the key to make the rest of the collaboration work well. Um, it's also important that we prepare the companies, the students, and especially the supervisors, because there are many stakeholders in those kind of projects with both local and, and uh, if you can say global supervisors for the whole project. Um, so that gives some overhead, which is why it can be difficult to do smaller projects. Um, based on the feedback I have received from the students, it also has have a positive impact on employment. So uh, after finishing the project, people have written to me that uh, this actually helped them getting a job because they could collaborate and because they could work with people from other countries. Uh, we see more students being encouraged to study abroad. So maybe for some of them, this is the first step and then they get more appetite on internationalization and they choose to do a semester abroad after this. And also from students who finish their studies and now are working abroad, also feeling that this experience encouraged them to, to do this. And you can find more information in our website. I think it's super challenging to present what we have done in 10 minutes, but I hope it gave a little bit of flavor of how we can actually have international collaboration and working on real life problems, um, mainly based on virtual collaboration, but also with some physical components. And I think that this space where we are mixing the physical and the virtual learning spaces, I think it's, it's so super interesting. So um, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Jens. There are a couple of questions in the chat. I'll start with the content related questions. How do you put together the student groups by experience, interests, programs, etc.? And how often do these student groups meet, physical or uh, online? Uh, so uh, how we put them together is that the students, are, actually we have, we make a number of product proposals that the students can, can choose from. Uh, so the students, when they apply, they ask to apply for a specific uh, product proposal. And in the product proposals, which we make together with the companies, then we also specify what kind of students are needed, what kind of competences are needed. And then we form the groups based on the applications in a way so that, um, so that everyone, uh, so that all the groups are international. So it's really important for us that all the groups have this, uh, have this international flavor. And how often do they meet? Um, I think it's, it depends from group to group. They have, we have only, 
we have only one big meeting, uh, the one we had in Hamburg, but then virtually they meet usually once per week or once every two weeks. Okay, thank you. And then there's one more question on the Erasmus Plus funding. How did you manage to organize the face-to-face -face meetings with students, which are not summer or winter school formats? Uh, as long as it's at least five days, it's uh, it's eligible. So because I think I think it's eligible because it's part of uh, of this uh, virtual uh, of this blended learning. So because the collaboration both has virtual and physical components. And then we organize the seminars, and I think that's actually quite important uh, in a in a very joint fashion. So um, so we organize centrally. Uh, hotel meals locations etc so we could really bring the students together and uh, and i think the program johanna you also have been there it's really from early morning till late night so um, we make sure that the students don't only have they don't only go to school from nine till four but they really have a, a full uh, cultural experience as well and the same is true for the smaller group meetings where students also have to prepare a short program at least yeah. to show that they're not just partying. <laughs> exactly. Um, there's one more question, Jens, for you. Uh, how are you addressing the cross-institution recognition of the learning and also recognition by employers? <laughs> That's a very good question, actually. Um, so I think the biggest challenge is to get the additional work for the students in terms of collaboration, communication, etc., recognized at the individual institutions where it's not a part of the specific learning objectives. Um, but in general, they are recognized according to the, to the guidelines of the home universities. And from the companies, we encourage the companies also to give a statement and recommendation letter for the students afterwards. But at least, and I, I know from my university, and now we are running a bit over time, and and I shouldn't do this, but uh, but at least from our university, we are really working with with integrating uh, this kind of learning objective, what we call problem-based learning objectives, into the curricula, so we can reward the students for for spending time on collaboration, reflecting on how collaboration is working, and so on. And I think that. If you really want to do this in the best possible way, you make sure that you have the good alignment between the learning objectives, the way you do exams and the activities you do. And therefore, you should also integrate uh, collaboration skills, uh, communication skills, problem solving skills into the learning objectives. So I think that is also a learning point that the better this integration is, the better we can reward the students for the work they do. May I say something else, uh, Jens, on this? Yeah, I think we are running a little out of time, quick, but a quick question. Josep, you should very use quick, the chat. Very quick, it may be worth noting that our students in EPIC are mainly bachelor's, bachelor thesis students or master's thesis students or project students. So they are more uh, available for, for being um, together and also they are finishing the, the degree, you know what I mean? So this is something maybe we should uh, uh, stress, that's all. Yeah, I, I very much agree. And I think it, it, it also shows the differences between the universities because in, in Alba University, which is a problem-based learning university, our students are doing projects every semester. And therefore this is one project that fits in. Other universities have different cultures where it fits better with bachelor thesis or master thesis. In Hamburg, I know they have a research project, which is, I think, uh, six ECTS points where it fits in here. And, uh, and I think it's actually really nice to bring together students who are working with different amounts, because that's also what you experience in reality, is also that not everyone is spending the same amount of hours on a particular project. And uh, this is what we are trying to integrate here. So you can have a project where some students are spending six ECTS, and some students are spending 20 and some students are spending 30. Uh, it's not easy, but it's a super good learning experience for the students that they have to plan around this. And now I will stop, I will mute myself, uh, or I will not mute myself, I will move on to uh, the next presentation, which is by Eliseo. Um,
Vilalsa Perdomo and uh, on the triple helix of innovation. So um, I will stop my video here and Eliseo, uh, leave everything to you. Well, uh, we will talk very fast on this because we don't have too much time, okay? Um, anyway, we have uh, the presentations, they will be shared and if somebody wants to talk about this more in detail, we can do it later. So first thing is why we decide to work on this project, why we decide to think about the triple helix of innovation, why we decide to, to, to put uh, our efforts on challenge-based learning. Um, even though I am in Aston at the moment, uh, this project is a project that we are running at uh, the University of Lincoln, Lincolnshire in the east of the UK, and it's part of our biggest project, but I'm part of that project and we want to expand it to Aston too. So anyway, we go ahead. Trigger, why? Well, uh, we're in the business school and our concern is that we have to train, uh, according to the World Bank, isn't it? We have to train people for making decisions in this kind of volatile and unbounded circumstances. Uh, Deborah was talking about that and I think that is very clear for everybody. And the question was, okay, can we do that and train people to be able to use technology? Uh, can we... Can we help future professionals to work on this uh, by using these kind of tools? And well, part, our view is that yes, it, this can be done, but, um, but it's not so simple uh, because the traditional approaches uh, are, um, help us to, to teach, but that doesn't mean that they help us, uh, they help us students to learn on this. Um, and, and, and it's also very difficult because um, it can be learned in many different places in many different circumstances. So we have to take decisions where we will teach it and how. And particularly, how can we do that in such a way that can sort of impact into people? And that is where um, the triple helix uh, came into our mind. We were thinking, uh, you know, there is this decision, this, this, this analysis or this model that talks about how good it is to connect government, universities and industry to work together. And, 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 and not only that, there are uh, additional dimensions that uh, with this uh, triple helix on innovation, now they are adding additional elements like civil society and natural environment, probably to, to, to create a more clear uh, connection with this idea of sustainability. So what we said is, okay, we will try to do it. We will try to do this kind of connection between the three elements by looking also to society, civil society, and also to the natural environment. So what we said is, how can we do that? And, and the decision was, okay, we have to understand that first, we need to do it in such a way that this is useful for businesses. So businesses are able to uh, test ideas uh, through the use of digital technologies. And at the same time, we are providing students to opportunity, for opportunities to, you know, to learn how to be more creative, how to be more employable, how to be more digital. So we focus on SMEs. We focus on very small companies. In fact, we, 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 many of our companies where our students are working are micro because they have very good ideas, but what they don't have is the expertise and the time to explore technologies. And obviously we, we focus on the students, but on the students on many different fields. We were not looking only at business. We're talking about the students of uh, food design, computing, and many other areas, engineering. And we put them as, as usual uh, in teams to work on this. So we created this concept, the concept of what we call the University of Lincoln 4.0 Challenge. What is this about? Well, uh, we use um, the traditional challenge-based learning structure that is, involves three, three uh, specific actions. One is engaging, another is investigating, and the third one is acting. And the only thing we do uh, different is that we provide the idea and define the essential question. And finally, we evaluate uh, as part of a final mark. So we integrate this into the curricula as part of the mark of a module. But apart from that, we continue using exactly the same approach of the challenge-based learning. Uh, we, we, we identify uh, how to do it, and then we said, well, we will organize this um, in a very formal way. We will talk with different organizations. We will talk with organizations within the university without, uh, and outside. Uh, we will discuss with them possibilities of exploring uh, digital services, uh, 
like uh, big data, etc. That was the original idea. Uh, the problem with it is that um, it's very difficult to organize this in a, a traditional university that has very compartmentalized departments and that uh, is trained to teach in very particular ways, in very particular chunks with, you know, 15 cats, uh, and that's the space, and then you have this amount of hours, and you have to teach in the, this particular way, and you have to provide me the marks in this particular way. So that probably was the most difficult part for us. It was easier to find companies and to find students able to participate and to convince the people of the registry to accept the way we were doing this. At the end, it was approved, but it was really very difficult to implement. So the plan was uh, to look at Lincolnshire. Lincolnshire is a county in the east of uh, England. Uh, it's a very uh, rural area, um, not very good in terms of roads. Uh, lots of uh, small farms uh, interested on uh, adding value to their products. So the decision was how can we integrate, uh, uh, sorry, how to, what can we integrate digital technologies? So as we said, um, we focus in, in, in increasing employability of students by providing them technology-based entrepreneurial entrepreneurship and problem-solving skills, and for businesses particularly to help them to identify how to transform their dreams into real business ideas. So the first thing we did in February 18 uh, was to run a very initial pilot. This pilot involved several organizations, a theater, there was a theater, there was a company that packs potatoes and there is a company that is a printer. And with them, we introduce the students and they begin to work with these projects. The success of this project gave us the opportunity to apply for Comfree, uh, for a project in the Interreg North Sea region. This project is a very big project that is looking at how to support regional innovation by uh, helping on specialization strategies. Uh, the project involves uh, several countries in, in Europe and based on that then we did um, an initial project that was done with a big company, Teledyne is a defense company, they have a piece of equipment that they use to, you know, for missiles and then they said to see if it was any possibility to use it for some more peaceful and commercial uh, concept. So what we did, sorry, what we did is to, to develop this project uh, with them students participate from September to December. Uh, we aggregate this project into a particular module. The module is a module on operations management and it ran quite well. So uh, it was the first time that the university accepted us to use this kind of project as a marking system. The following year, we have just finished, we introduced many more companies. A coffee shop, that is a family coffee shop, uh, uh, an NGO, a food bank, uh, uh, a company that has two, two, two limousines for weddings, you know, a little of everything. This company, ISPB, uh, is designing drones for 5G and they have a very big contract from the government, something like five million pounds. So we have a little of everything. And students participated in this. So this time we use exactly the same approach. We took uh, operations management as the module, the core module. We took 200 students, we distributed them into the groups, and they were looking at the companies, looking at which were the ideas, commercial ideas they had in mind, and how technical digital technologies can help them to do it. In this case, it was more about Internet of Things. This one was about robotics. Uh, this one was more about uh, data analysis. Rudox was also about data analysis. This one, these two were about Internet of Things and also about uh, how to increase uh, the presence in Internet. And the University of Lincoln was about uh, control systems, uh, automatic control systems for buildings, for environment, because they have ISO 14. So in other words, we, this is a progression. We were moving from six days up to a semester. We were moving from being independent into associated into a module. We begin with 15, we finish with 203. You know, we have been moving. In fact, the last one was the most interesting one because we're talking about digital technologies and the best way to prove that digital technologies work is by making people to work in digital technologies. So uh, it was very interesting that the students finished the semester working with the companies, everything done online. In fact, the ceremony award that we run was online. Everybody was you know, reasonably happy. So what we learned in terms of operations management and challenge-based learning, the first thing is that we need to introduce a reflective cycle model. So it's not enough 
just to show the students a project and giving them, you know, solve it. It's a little more than that. If we want to introduce that and embed, if, they, if we want them to embed all the knowledge and all the experiences, we need them to think about what has happened and how it ran. So for us, that is fundamental. And based on that, we decided to, we, we develop this kind of conceptual model. This conceptual model is particularly for operations management, but you will notice that is a, a general application. First is all the cycles that we follow to do a challenge-based learning. Then we put that, we embed that into a theme. The theme is industry. In this case, it was industry for zero technologies. It could be anything else. We can have different big ideas and questions and challenges. That doesn't matter. We can decide to do something else. We did it in operations management. So we decide to use a set of key performance indicators. This is the traditional key performance indicators that you can find in operations management uh, literature, but this can be changed into any kind of uh, expectations or aims that you have in your own project. And finally, we embed that into um, we embed that into a cycle of reflection. Finally, we send that for the students to share it with uh, with with the uh, with the community by means of uh, we do a presentation, but we also do posters, presentation. We do a virtual a virtual exhibition, etc. So, in summary, what can we say about this experience? Uh, in terms of students, what we did is we we look at their re reflections and we did a anal thematic analysis and we identify that the students well. They, they, they recognize themselves that they have a much clearer understanding of how to use uh, industry procedural technologies. We also, they also recognize that they were learning how to collaborate better. Uh, they were feeling themselves better, more, more, more confident on problem solving, creativity, adaptability, etc. And, and many of them were claiming that uh, it was very nice for them to, for first time, because this is a module of second year, for first time, to be involved in a project with a team that is an extremely uh, complex problem and that they haven't done it ever. So they like it. They like it a lot and they like a lot, obviously, all the formative assessment that we were giving them continuously. Um, obviously, they also recognize that there is a connection between theory and practice. It's not just going into, you know, talking and talking about operations management because it's a little dry the topic's a little little dry isn't it it's only interesting for people like me uh, and finally something that we like is the distinction between cvl and pbl and pol no uh, challenge based learning has an advantage between against problem solving uh, problem based learning or project oriented learning and is that in problem based learning you have to give the students a very clear definition of what are you looking at and in project we have to identify that as, as, as any project, it has a begin and an end. And, um, and no, we don't think that's the case. Uh, what we want is to put in the mind of the students uh, this need to continue challenging themselves and to continue working in, in these projects and these ideas. In fact, many of our students, when they finish uh, the challenge-based learning, they usually go into what they call the sandwich year. So they go to work into a company for one year. And some of them are working into companies that were part of this project. So they are very interested. Others are participating um, voluntarily, for instance, in the food bank, continuing with the project. And our expectation is, um, as part of this uh, COM3 project that we are involved, uh, we decided to discuss this with the County Council in Lincolnshire, so they are now members of this project. And what we're doing is we are taking the companies with the students, we provide the business idea with the students, and then if the company is convinced, then they move with the Lincolnshire County Council for uh, finding additional funds or finding additional opportunities to do something with themselves. And well, and that's it. Thank you. Thank you so much. We are okay. moving on yeah. to the yes. next presentation by yeah. Angelo Carbon from Bologna. Um, okay, thank you for the organizer for inviting me uh, to this nice uh, webinar. So I'm pleased to present you 
um, a brief report about the ITFE project. ITFE is um, on teaching and learning with an innovative approach. Um, uh, the project uh, can be summarized with uh, four uh, keywords. Uh, one is the tradition because uh, physics uh, is, is, a, is a, a field uh, in which we, we have a, a long tradition in, in teaching and so uh, we would like uh, with this project to, to, to make together the tradition and the innovation also because uh, uh, our um, field of uh, teaching and also research is uh, um, very close to innovation and uh, technologies um, that are very, very um, innovative. Uh, learning, of course, is, is a key word uh, because our, our aim is to, to learn and uh, to the students and to provide them with uh, new uh, uh, skills. And uh, uh, another key work is uh, the teamwork, okay? So you can find more uh, on, on the website of itfe.eu. Um, the, the consortium of the project is a synergy between a university and a research institution. So we make a, a tandem um, consortium where each country uh, has a, a university with, with the UNIBO, the Alma Mater Studium of Bologna, with the University of uh, Dortmund and with the, the University of clermont auvergne in, in France. And each university is strictly connected with the research institution. So it's, it's a very uh, important synergy with the, uh, and we, we try to push the, the synergy not only in, in the research which is already active but also in teaching. So the research context because as I told you we are um, all, all the people involved in the project uh, came from uh, for a very strong research context is uh, in physics in particular in high energy physics uh, all of us are involved in research activities at the Large Hadron Collider at CERN uh, um, I, I don't know if, if you know about that. However, it, it is a famous place uh, which uh, recently provide uh, important achievement uh, in, in the field of understanding the fundamental force of the nature. Um, so, um, uh, if you want to know more about CERN, you can also visit the, the website. Um, I mean, the project is, is based uh, on, um, on an approach which put together a team of students uh, from the master's degree, so they are advanced students uh, from different universities. Uh, it's a very similar approach to ETIC, so they, they, to the ETIC project. So they, they, will, they work together, supervised by teachers and researchers from the consortium. And so the, the goals are to increase internationalization at the level of the master's degree, uh, to provide students with uh, teamwork skills and to promote uh, international mobility. So the project uh, foresees uh, three intellectual outputs. Uh, the one is the, the, to provide guided exercise with solutions in, in a learning platform. Um, we also uh, put together a web-based platform to support the project with several tools. And the idea is to, to have uh, tools, uh, ICT tools that are open source. And in the end, we collect all our work, all our experience in, in, a, in a report. So the project uh, uh, is uh, almost at the end. So it will end in October 2020 after six months of extension due to, to the COVID emergency. Um, our teaching is, uh, is um, based also on spring schools and we, we use it during the project the spring schools um, that uh, uh, has, has been held in Cargese in Corsica, a very nice place. Uh, we use the schools to, to pilot uh, as a pilot uh, for our tools and also for um, our uh, project uh, where the student presented their uh, activity. Uh, so the schools are not only uh, is based on the project of the students and the real project of the students, but also on additional and intensive uh, lecture on, on high energy physics. Uh, unfortunately, the 2020 edition was held online due to the, to the emergency. 
Um, okay, the, this is just to give you an idea. Uh, and uh, the, the school is, is a schedule with several lectures. There is one day uh, fully dedicated to the students where the students present their results. I will speak a bit more later about the activities of the students. And we also organize a social activity like uh, uh, volleyball on, on the beach or uh, other activity during, during the, the summer school. Um, one important thing is that the school itself uh, um, is not only the school, is the school plus uh, what we call tandem project activities, uh, I will give you a few details later, uh, is able to award in an official way by the University of Bologna six uh, uh, credits to the students so they can be used uh, uh, by them in their local university but also they can be used in one of the courses of the University of Bologna which is dedicated to the advanced professional research skill in physical science so this kind of course is quite open uh, the student can do in principle whatever they like but they have to provide uh, to the coordinator of, of the master that they have done some work in, in soft skill so uh, the idea uh, now is that this kind of activity is uh, completely embedded in the master degree in physics at the university of Bologna. So the, the, the main activity of the student is called a tandem project because at the beginning we, we talked about pairing the students in two, but uh, then we realized that we can also make a team of more than one, uh, two students. And uh, the idea of course is to work together for uh, a final aim. And uh, uh, this is a snapshot of the tandem project activity that we, we are carrying on uh, right now. And uh, um, there are 11 projects uh, where there are uh, three, four, two students coming from different university uh, put together and um, work uh, to a real research project. Uh, a real research is a project in high energy physics, so it is in strict contact with the activities that are done uh, at CERN. And uh, um, okay, the, the timeline of, 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 the, of the activity is that the, the team uh, are defined in the October 2019. This is just an example of this year. Uh, the team uh, performs research for two semesters. And each team meets uh, regularly. Of course, uh, the organization is, is, uh, is, uh, of, the, of the work of the team is, uh, is uh, local, so is not uh, uh, centralized. Every team organizes themselves among the students and, and with the supervisors. We have two general meetings where the activity are presented to all the students. And then there is a, f a final report about them at the spring school. And as I told you, this year was uh, done online. And then uh, they, they have to write a final report naming a real scientific paper because uh, one of the skills that the students uh, has, has to provide for their future career is to write a scientific paper. So we, we just uh, set up a scheme where they can uh, fill with, the, with their results um, a paper and the paper is also reviewed by the supervisor. And then there is a final grade of all these activity uh, and award of uh, ACT by July 2020. The, uh, okay, this is very brief. We, we have set up uh, different, uh, I, um, different tools uh, for chatting, uh, a Moodle tool where we, we put the activities and all the information for the students. And then we have also a video conference tool uh, and a, um, a share LaTeX. Okay, LaTeX is, is a typical way how to write a, a document in a scientific world. So there is a, 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 a place where they, they can work uh, simultaneously to the same document together. Okay, so uh, in conclusion, ITF proposes an innovative and, and conventional approach to teaching uh, is mainly based on the approach of working uh, teaching uh, is uh, complementary to the frontal lectures. So, so is, is um, an additional uh, element that we would like to provide uh, in, in, uh, in the master courses. So uh, promote internet Analyzation and also uh, provide uh, the, the student with additional skills that are useful not only for their academic career but also for non academic career. So it's a worldwide project. I didn't say too much about that, but we also are in, in contact with the non European uh, university that uh, um, uh, send us, uh, especially to the spring and summer school students. So we, we get the special funding for that by the University of Bologna. 
So we are um, ending our project. And our next step is to transform this uh, synergy among the university in an international joint master's degree in particle physics. And this is not an easy uh, task, but uh, we expect and we are on, on a way to, to start this uh, master's degree in, in the next 2021-2022 uh, academic year. That's all for, from my side and thanks for your attention. Thank you very much. I am checking if there are any questions. There is actually a general question, which I would like to ask around. What is the most effective way of assessing a digital tool's impact or influence on students' learning? Ah, well, I'm, I'm going to answer the same way as I answered before. It's not about the tool, it's about the way it's used. Um, so it really is, and I think others have uh, already said this in their presentations about clearly defining the uh, learning outcomes uh, and then aligning the assessment to that. Um, so there's obviously issues, especially when we're looking at collaborative learning in assessing group work, um, how much comes from the individual, how much comes from the group. Um, looking at uh, the difference between um, assessing the process and the final outcome, uh, especially if you've got project-based learning. Um, uh, I can bring in, in an example from my own teaching where I was using uh, project-based learning uh, with uh, uh, international groups. And uh, the objective was, the final outcome was a media artifact, but I was more interested in looking at the, the process and in particular the intercultural competences, the communication, the teamwork. So you have to have a very, very detailed rubric um, uh, and be very, very transparent with the students as well on what you're assessing. Um, the way the tools came into this was that um, uh, the students were free to choose whichever communication tools, digital communication tools they wanted to communicate within the groups because they weren't always face to face. And what I asked them to do was to think critically about the tools that they chose um, and then explain how those tools supported their communication process. And one of the things we found was at the beginning, they multiplied their channels, they had a WhatsApp group, they were using Facebook, they were using Google documents, and then they had to pare that down to the most efficient and the most effective. And they themselves came to the realization that they were dispersing information over too many channels. So for me, that was, a, that was learning in itself, but it didn't come from the tools, it came from the critical reflection that I, I engaged them in, in their choice of tools. Thank you very much. So also a kind of learning by doing approach there, you explained. I think I can add um, a point in uh, probably um, answering the question from a slightly different perspective. If the question is about assessing the usefulness of the tool and how that affects learning, I think the most effective way would be to cross-validate. So to split the group randomly into two and give one group a task that can be performed without a tool and then the same learning task that can be performed with a tool and then switch and then check the retention or assess learning um, outcomes in some other way and see if they're different and if the groups are big enough and if the tasks are implemented similarly enough you can um, deduct the if the tool, the use of tool affects the learning outcomes. Thank you so much, Michael. Yeah, in line with your question and the answer from Deborah and, uh, and uh, you, Michael. Um, so I clearly see that each project has used uh, digital tools to, to learn, uh, to, to promote or to engage learning and or in different ways. Uh, so I see, uh, I clearly see uh, an opportunity for a second webinar, uh, like a second edition of this web webinar, oriented mainly more to participants of our project, but not only, but with uh, the goal of finding which um, results, achievements of our projects can be useful for the others. So interchange of uh, results more than just explain what we are doing. 
I think this could be maybe done in September or something. Uh, but it's, for me, it's clear that uh, it would be very, very interesting to to inter uh, interchange to to interchange ideas about what our children. For instance, Deborah and Eliseo has already started to to check a potential collaboration, right? So I see clearly that uh, we could. Uh, do it more intensive, uh, in a more intensive way. But not only for us, also for external people can be useful. Okay, I could maybe pick up on this because I put in the chat that I have a, a suggestion for taking this forward. Obviously, this was um, uh, just us getting to know each other in public um, and to, so already bringing new people into the conversation. Um, in very, very concrete terms, we could be inspired by um, uh what we've done in the uh eden uh network we had our uh the conference of the european distance and e-learning network uh this week and uh i see actually on the on the the webinar program that i'm down as being part of eden rather than uned which i am because i'm on the the fellows council board of eden um, and we're doing a lot of work on synergies between european projects and we had a synergies session yesterday um and uh, somebody uh, took all the uh, summaries, the abstracts of the, the projects, and uh, analyzed those and did a grid, like a matrix, uh, to actually visualize where those synergies are in terms of target audience, in terms of scope, in terms of focus. Um, so I think it might be useful for us to do that amongst these projects. Um, and then, um, as Joseph, you said, look at how our results can be useful for uh, those of, of other projects uh, to avoid obviously everybody reinventing the wheel which does happen sometimes in European projects but um, again massive massive thanks to Jens for uh, initiating this this has widened the scope of my knowledge of European projects um, beyond those which I you know which I know and interact with on a regular basis so uh, this is uh, this is a, a, an incredible initiative thank you again Thank you very much for your comments, Deborah. And we will definitely follow up with whatever we can do to keep the networking going. There is just one question that arrived just now. How do you keep students motivated to work virtually from different cultures as a group also during the time of this pandemic? Angelo. Yes, I, I, I would like to say that I think that it depends on the subject. Um, for example, in my field, we are uh, usually meet uh, online and virtually and we work uh, uh, from our laptop in our office uh, on data analysis, for example, or things like that. So I think that the motivation is uh, the network itself, even if it's virtual, uh, is in any case uh, um, very uh, mo motivates a lot of the students because they know to be part of a network. And also the, the various uh, appointments. So the, the summer school, even if it was online, uh, was a part in where they are active. So promoting uh, um, them to be active, uh, for example, with a presentation, or also preparing the final report that will be marked and reviewed by a supervisor is a way to, 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 to make them. And this is independent by the fact that there was an emergency or not. But okay, for other activities, maybe it's not the same. Thank you, Michael. Like Do you have something to add? I would like to add something to Angelo. And for yeah. us, um, we also um, try to uh, pursue on the active learning part. So uh, we make virtual meetings or video conferences with the students to motivate them and we give deadlines and uh, discuss with them um, uh, what deadline would be realistic for writing reports, submitting. So we always try to get their opinion so that they can have the feeling that they can have control about the learning process and they can also decide. Yes, and we try to support and I mean, of course, with writing email, but also like with the video conferencing. Yeah. If I can add something, I think I think also from in our part, I think the fact that the students know each other and that they are also a little bit friends, I think is a is an important motivator. 
and also that they're working with the, with the sustainable development goals. I was really impressed how much the real problem and, and um, the fact that they can make a difference for real people was, um, was motivating them. Uh, and even when they couldn't do their field studies, they were still interested in then how close could they come? Could they speak to someone who had been working with the waste pickers and so on? So I think that, that the good problems and the good social relations, I think, are super important uh, motivating factors. Now, Michael, do you want to add something? Yeah, I wanted to add a short comment saying that we discovered a um, very um, significant difference in teaching online in the time of the pandemic between courses where the students are involved in formal education programs where they probably know each other and they get credits for their achievements and um, that they probably also started the same course in face-to-face -face. so in this kind of courses um, synchronous activities work uh, more or less all right they they work well and uh, the uh, these courses are very different from those that start online and they open to anyone to join and the students don't really know each other at all synchronous activities uh, don't really work also um, time zones so in our courses for example we had somewhere between 50 and 250 students and um, they all are in, in very different countries and time zones and synchronous activities didn't really work that well we had very few people and at the same time when we are all teaching in our home universities where students are involved in the uh, formal programs the attendance is, is much much higher it could be up to 70 percent of all the students Thank you. Um, there are more questions in the chat, but I think we are also approaching the end. Uh, we were scheduled to finish the quarter to 12. That is in exactly one minute. So I think that the, I will be now closing the webinar. Thank you to all the participants for joining. Thank you to all the presenters for jumping in on this crazy idea, which started by us uh, uh, going through the Erasmus Plus the database and uh, finding projects and I'm, I'm really impressed how much how many interesting things are going on out there uh, I hope we will keep in touch and I will if you send your presentations to me I will distribute the presentations uh, to all the participants and also to us and then I definitely think we should uh, we should keep on moving and learning from each other and keep in touch I hope uh, we will do that I will try to facilitate it as well um, so um, thank you all, and I will, I, I'm really curious what I have recorded, because it's the first time I'm recording a Zoom seminar, but I hope that I have recorded something useful, and then I will, of course, also distribute that. So thank you all for joining and uh, presenting and being here, and uh, have a nice day and a nice summer. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks. Bye bye. 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 Definitely. Bye. And if you need some help, yes, I'm happy to collaborate. Um, Great. And I'm pulling things together. No problem. Okay. Okay. Bye, everybody. Bye, bye, bye. Bye, bye. bye, -bye. <laughs>